Hey everyone, welcome to episode number 16 of The Photo Show. My name is Brian Matias. Today is October 30th, 2016. It's a beautiful Sunday in Portland, overcast, not much rain. High 50s, low 60s, it's perfect. And tomorrow's Halloween, so happy early Halloween, everyone. So today, I figured we would uh, cover some big announcements that happened earlier in the week, uh, specifically with Microsoft and with uh, Apple. And I'll share some of my opinions, uh, share some kind of insights that I have from, from both, and then we'll do an unboxing of uh, this new pair of Bose Bluetooth head or earbuds that I got. I, I actually got it like a month ago and they've just been, uh, just been sitting there sealed. I wanted to do an unboxing for some reason. So you can also take part in the comments here. Um, let me just, I think I have to refresh Chrome to see. So yeah, every time I refresh the Chrome window, it'll update. So please be sure if you have questions throughout the show, uh, I'll be checking pretty regularly. Uh, and with that, let's go ahead and talk about our first announcement by Microsoft of all things. Uh, and specifically, they made some you know hardware refreshes to their Surface Book, um, but the big story this week was the Surface Studio, which is this all-in-one 28-inch uh, touch-enabled screen with an embedded computer at the base. Kind of the same model as an iMac, except the iMac, which is right over here, doesn't have touch. So here's the thing. I said it in the episode 15, the last episode, I worked for Wacom. Wacom makes uh, tablets. They make uh, the Cintiq, which is a uh, touch-enabled display. And as soon as I saw the announcement and I looked at everything, I went, we have a really fantastic utility that I use at work called Sprinkler and it allows for some exceptionally robust listening capabilities. So I did a custom listening query to look for any comparison, any, anything that had the words Microsoft and Surface Studio and Wacom, it had to have Wacom in it. And sure enough, I started seeing um, a bunch of people calling this like, you know, the death knell of Wacom, the death knell of the Cintiq. And I was like, oh, that's, that's a really interesting thing. And uh, so uh, I, I read somewhere that day that Microsoft stores already had the Surface Studio in stores to try out. And I thought that was really impressive. So I, I tip the hat to Microsoft for that because you know a lot of times with Apple, um, when they announce something or other companies that have retail stores, you're waiting weeks until it's there um, because they're doing pre-orders. But with Microsoft, they actually got it in stores right away. I find that to be Really, really impressive. So the next day, the day of the Apple launch, um, I went over to the to the Microsoft store uh, in Portland because we have one, and they sure enough had three units of the Surface Studio. And so let me first, I'm I'm gonna first show you a video I took. So I had my iPhone and I took some videos. I went with my colleague and um, who is uh, schooled. He's 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 academically trained in uh, illustration. So. He is an ideal customer for this. And I'm going to I have I'm going to play this video and I'm going to I'm going to have the voice over. So I'm going to walk you through it. So here that's the Surface Studio. First, what I want to do is check how, uh, you know, it is to, to touch. And you can see what I'm doing is I'm just tapping. I'm not pressing hard. And you can see in the reflection how wobbly that is. Now, that, that's a big problem for me um, because the last thing I want to do, especially if I'm holding the pen light, is get wobbles. The second thing is the dial. I don't know if this is an early version of it uh, or if it's a final version, but the dial, if you watch, keeps sliding down and this display is at its lowest. And then finally, the thing I did here was this pen was physically making contact with the display um, and no input was registering until I pressed harder. And this goes to one of the things that, I, one of the points I make, again, I went here as objectively as possible. Um, I wasn't looking, please know. The reason why I'm so clear that I work for Wacom and I'm telling these things is because I don't want people to think that I'm out on some crusade to make the Surface Studio look bad. No, the reason why I went is because I saw all of these comparisons to the Cintiq 27 inch specifically, where the 27 inch is, you know, $26.99, I think, and for $300 more, you get a full computer. Okay, so you get a full computer. That's where I get frustrated with people because they just look at the full computer. They don't look at actually what's powering the display. 
If you look at the specs of this full computer, it's actually quite underpowered. The GPU that they're using is not very robust. It's an i5 processor, and I think, I think it has eight gigs of RAM. Um, I can pull it up on the website. You're going upwards of $4,000 when you want to get to a computer that can uh, handle the heavy load of editing uh, consistently. And I'm just, that's, I, that's the kind of uh, price that I have to spend when I'm editing uh, 4K video or I'm editing uh, massive uh, Photoshop files. That's just the way it is. Um, so yes, um, it does have a computer, but look at that. Uh, also, this is something that I, I don't understand why no one brought up. So look at that. That's the that's the Surface Studio at its lowest angle. What I the, like the drawing angle. And if you look at that display, there's no reflection. There's no reflection in it, it which is mind boggling to me. Um, it's not a matte display. It's a, it's a glass display. And as you could see in the video, which I can you, you know you can I posted it on my on Facebook on my profile. You can see it. It reflects. So unless you're in some sort of a side lit studio if you have any lights or anything above you when you're down there like that it's going to have reflection the cintiq has a matte display for one, that's one of the main reasons that it has that and also because it um, the the matte texture gives you a little bit more toothiness when you're drawing so it feels uh, more like pen on paper and speaking of the pen the other thing that no one seemed to talk about two things one the uh the microsoft surface pen has i think 1024 levels of pressure sensitivity and the cintiq the current cintiq has um, twice that and the uh, mobile studio pro which uh, is the the kind of mobile the uh, cintiq companion uh, the next generation that that wacom announced uh, last month in october no it was still in october um has four times that, like 8,000 levels of pressure sensitivity. Now you might be thinking that uh, that's all marketing and, and in some cases it absolutely is, you know, marketing like, oh, we have, you know, 2,046 or 48 levels of pressure sensitivity. But that right there is what happens. That's the difference of when you, um, where I had the pen on that Surface Studio drawing and nothing was happening. Cause I went straight back to my Cintiq at work. I have a 27 inch at work and I did the exact same thing. Very light brush stroke register just fine. So these are the things, if you want to compare apples to apples, compare the feature sets, compare what you're actually getting. There's a reason why, for instance, Apple charges as much as it does, why now Google is charging as much as, much as it does for its Pixel and Pixel XL, and why Microsoft is charging $3,000 for an entry level, but $4,000 for a, a beefy machine. It's because you get what you pay for. There's pricing there. I mean, it's not, it, it, it's very simple. You know, this iPhone 7 Plus costs almost $1,000, but it has 256 gigs of solid state storage inside of it. It has some of the most amazing optics I've ever used on a mobile phone. Yes, the Pixel, same thing, works wonderfully, but you're paying for it, you're paying for it. So when you look at a Cintiq and you wonder why it's so expensive, there's 35 years of, of specialized technology in that. and. I'm not speaking as a Wacom employee. I'm speaking simply as someone who looked at all this stuff and just got really frustrated that everyone's just looking at face value, not really analyzing. So let's wait until the real reviews come out. That's what I'm waiting for. That's why I, what I advise the executives at Wacom to do. Let's wait till the reviews come out. I'm sure that people are going to really be happy. It's a, it's a definitely a capable product and it's a beautiful product. No question about it. Beautiful product. But if you want to compare apples to apples, take all the factors and don't just say, well, the, the Cintiq is a $2,700 display and the Studio is $3,000 computer dis, you know, pen display. Qualify that. What is the experience for both? And then come back and see whether it's worth it to you or not. And just as a shameless plug for Wacom, last week we silent, kind of silently announced that we now have financing for Cintiqs for mobile studios. So kind of like what Apple does, what Microsoft does, we now do for the Cintiq so you can uh, finance uh, the, pr the purchase of that stuff. We're going to announce it, you know, more, uh, I guess, louder later, but it is live. It, go to Wacom.com and see it. I'm going to jump to see if there are any comments. All right, Josh, Josh, one of my oldest buddies. Uh, Microsoft has, uh, oh wait, I have to bring the comments up first. Let me do that. There we go. 
All right. So Josh is saying uh, Microsoft, again, has a great idea and misses the details. Are you saying that the display doesn't go full flat? So um, first, yeah, listen um, to Josh's first point. Yes, Microsoft executed really well for a V1. And I'm saying that V1, it's a V1. So um, I expect that they will get a lot of feedback. I expect it to be a, a very successful product. Great timing, right in time for the holidays. Um, I expect some criticism, some feedback. Um, I expect some returns because of performance, but I also expect that version two is gonna come out of the, the gate strong. Um, Windows 10, now we can talk about Windows 10 and Mac OS Sierra. Um, I, um, I think Windows 10 has made huge leaps, um, but, and, and I, I was, there's a thread on Facebook right now by a photographer named Athena Carey. And I saw people, you know, um, talking about Windows versus Mac and, and you know, what, what's the discussion there? It's the same thing with iOS or Android. It's at the bottom, at the end of the day, for the most part, both operating systems will do exactly what they need for you. Um, for me, it comes down to the user experience. Um, there's nothing on my Mac that I can't do. I'm not a big computer gamer. That's why I have a PlayStation and an Xbox. I don't play games on my computer. So gaming is not an issue. It might be for you, but it isn't for me. So when I talk about user experience, I personally find that the uh, Mac, Mac OS Sierra just, I mean, it, it I, I, someone said I, Colby or someone called, that, that there's increase in bugs. I totally disagree with that. I don't know what you're talking about or what you're seeing. I run GM betas of, of each operating system. And aside from with betas, some of the bugs, when GM comes out, for me, it's always been rock solid. I've never bricked a device. I don't have to install my operating system and wait an hour to download a thousand updates, security updates, malware updates. Um, not to say that Mac OS is impervious, but in my experience, it is just a much more fluid operating system. And there is something to say, Microsoft understands this and Google does as well. There is something to say when you have a closed ecosystem. So with, with Apple, they make the hardware and they make the operating system. It's tuned, it's optimized the iPhone and iOS, iPad and iOS, tuned and optimized. Now Google all of a sudden, oh, with their Pixel, now they're making their hardware, they're controlling it so that they can um, uh, make sure that Android is as optimized as possible. Microsoft, this is their first foray into an all-in-one computer. Why? So they can control it. I mean, there's something to be said. So, so let's just be straight about things. Yes, you can buy a thousand different computers on with Windows um, and deal with all sorts of environmental and driver issues that just ruin the user experience. Go for it. You can spend a fraction of the price for one of those compared to um, an Apple machine. But wait, let's let's talk again in a year or two as more Microsoft specific and Google specific machines are built. And then we'll talk about price. We'll talk about the value of optimization because Guess what happened with Android? And guess what happened with Windows? This utter fragmentation. Anyone is left to the, any manufacturing go make their own Android phone and slap whatever version of Android skin on top of it and just ruin the, the user experience. Who wants that? So yeah, well, you know, let's call a spade a spade. Let's be real and not just kind of jump to conclusions because it gets so boring. Let's see if there are any updated questions. Uh, all right. Then, oh, so Josh was asking also um, if, let me scroll back up, more comments. Um, what, wait, where did Josh's go? Brian, my buddy Brian from Think Tank Mindshift. What's going on, dude? Hope to see you sometime soon. Um, Josh asks whether if it folds flat. No, it doesn't. It, it sits at a, you know, like a, I can't remember what angle it is, but it's, it's slightly raised, which you want. Say, our Cintiqs, um, if you don't buy the Ergo stand, which is amazing. Um, that it has these little fold out legs. So you're not, so if it lay it flat, the display, at least on the Satique would wobble. Um, and if the Surface Studio laid flat, I don't know that you, that you possibly could lead to some sort of bending of the display. Um, so I, I think the, the little bit of a raised uh, angle is, is good. It's a little bit more comfortable. Um, but again, reflections, they're going to plague you. Um, all right. What else do we have here for comments? And then I want to move on to the MacBook Pro because that's another issue. Um, Carlos, thank you very much for the Wacom Kick-Ass Technologies. Um, 
we do need to be more aggressive. And so, so, so what Carlos is saying here is we need to be more aggressive. And, and I think I'm going to read into his comments, Carlos, you can, you can confirm. Um, so I, I manage the social media strategy for the company and I'll be the first to say that we're lacking compared to other people. And, but, um, we are going to, we're going to improve on that. We're going to be, um, reaching more people. We're going to be more aggressive in our communications. Uh, but what I want to do is make sure that we don't, we, I'm not in this to celebrate the products. I'm in it to celebrate the creatives. That's my social media strategy. I want to show you people who are doing really cool stuff, not people who are using Wacom products. You'll make that natural leap that Wacom is involved just by us sharing it with you. So that's coming. It just, believe me, it's a very, very um, slow process, but it is a process that's in motion. Um, let's see what else we have here. Uh, la, 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 la. Just join, so I don't know what you're talking about. Do you prefer to draw on the screen like this antique or do you? Use in so that's a good question. So what Chris is asking is whether for me, um, I, whether I prefer drawing on a Cintiq or drawing on a tablet, which I use an Intuos. So personally, I prefer using a tablet, um, because I like to have, like, I want to be looking at the display with nothing covering it. Um, as a, if I was an illustrator, that would not, that would be second nature because you're always drawing on a canvas or on a piece of paper. So I think it's more natural, but for, um, a photographer where you're, you're editing in most cases, you start editing globally. Um, you want to see the entirety of the image. You have your tools on either side of the display. Um, so because I'm so familiar with my, uh, I have an Intuos, uh, pro large. It's, it's a, it's a big, uh, tablet, but that's how I use. I also use my express keys with that said, um, because I want to be able to talk about all of our products, um, with intelligence and with experience. I also have at work a 27 inch, the current gen Cintiq display, and I've used it as well. The problem is, um, like with Lightroom, I'm left-handed. So I hold my pen, you know, like this. And Lightroom's controls are all on the right side. So I have to, you know, physically put my entire forearm over the display. So what I've done instead was um, I've, uh, I use the touch. So I have this Cintiq 27 that's touch enabled and I just use my fingers to scroll physically on the display. And it's okay, the Lightroom is not optimized for touch on Mac. I would think if it did, the, there would be a bit more distance. So you, you know, you made sure that you actually hit the, the slider. So that's just me, but Colby, my buddy, he's got, um, a Cintiq, he uses that. So, um, I, uh, the reason why I like capture one, which I'm still strongly looking at is because you can control where any panel goes, um, like, like Photoshop. Um, so for left-handed people, it would be easier. Um, I wish Lightroom would, would just do that, but we'll see. All right, one last look at the comments to see if there's anything else. Um, all right, we're good here. You can see Carlos uh, responding. So Carlos, thanks for that. Let's go on now to the uh, next announcement that came out today, which is Apple's MacBook Pro. <laughs> or we could call it um, adapter gate. So Apple announced their MacBook Pro. It's the first one, the first full refresh, I think, in four years. And uh, as soon as the announcement was done, I pre-ordered my maxed out 15 uh, inch full specs. And um, because I, I, I have the current maxed out 15 inch. Why did I do that? Well, um, because for a while uh, I, toy I used my own a laptop as my only machine. It was my, I would use it here at, at home and I would take it with me. But then I, um, I got an iMac just because I wanted to, when I was traveling more often, I wanted to be able to connect to my, my computer here so I can get access to my photos, like on, on my G technology, uh, raid arrays. I don't have all the raws in the cloud because it's just, I have too, it's just too much data. So I got a desktop, but I'm thinking to go back because I, in the past year, I thought about, it, I hardly ever connected. I have smaller portable drives that can bring the last few years of my raw files very easily. 
Plus that touch bar is freaking cool. So here's the thing. When Apple announced the um, this new MacBook Pro, one of the, you can see right there, the, um, blah, 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 blah. I'm so bad, there, right there. They doubled the size of the trackpad. So I was sitting at work and I, I saw the, you know, Phil Schiller talked about the double size trackpad and I looked over at my colleague who is um, in on our PR team. And I said, oh, I guess we're getting pencil support, which is, you know, an issue. That's because pencil is a hugely successful competitor. Um, but they didn't integrate pencil support, which I thought was a huge miss. Here's what I believe. I think that what we're going to see is... Um, a refreshed MacBook, like the 12-inch one, that will have pencil support. That'll be one of its defining features. Um, it'll also get a touch bar. And then the next generation of MacBook Pros will have the pencil support. It doesn't make sense not to do it. It makes absolutely... I can understand if Microsoft doesn't want a touch screen. Totally understand that. But to have a pencil there, I mean, they would sell that many more, more units. So, um, but overall, for me, let's, uh, let's talk about, you know the big issue, the big uh, elephant in the room, and that's the, the ports. All right. Four USB or four Thunderbolt 3, which shares the same specs as USB-C, same port, and can deliver just gobs and gobs of data so you can do multiple things on one out of one port. So everyone's freaking out. You took out the SD card reader and you took out, um, you know, the... Um, USB 3 ports. And yes, that's an inconvenience. For now, you have to use adapters. But let me, I'm gonna jump over really quickly to the wide camera. All right, so I don't see a big deal about this because one major reason, everyone's focusing on the now. Like, first of all, no one's forcing you to upgrade. You're not forced to have to buy a new MacBook Pro. Um, yes, it has new hardware. Um, yes, it's only 16 gigs of RAM, um, which I can understand because you still have to abide by the law of thermodynamics. The RAM will take up, will produce that much more heat, and maybe it's just for that size that they were that they were going for in that weight, they couldn't make it. And also, Phil, Phil Schiller was quoted as saying it would have um, an impact on battery life that they didn't feel was warranted. However, when you look at it, what is all stacked up with that i7 Intel processor, 16 gigs of faster RAM, don't forget that it is faster RAM, and bally GPU. I mean, that thing is going to be very powerful. So for me, that was alone worth it. But the other thing that I look at is where technology is going, not where it is now. So here, I've got, I bought this thing, um, the Satechi, I think it's Satechi. No, Juiced, Juiced Systems. I bought this on Amazon for like 15 or 20 bucks. USB-C, Thunderbolt uh, 3 compatible, SD card, micro SD, two USB-Cs and, um, oh, I'm sorry, two USB-3 ports and a pass-through USB-C. So you're not even cannibalizing the port. Not a big deal. Really not a big deal for me to, to, to bring. Especially because this laptop now, if we're talking about future proofing, everyone's freaking out about it, about it. In a year or so, you're gonna start to see a bunch of components. Everything will start be will start having USB-C. I mean, Google with and not just Google, but Android phones have already started paving the way with that. So has Apple with the first 12-inch MacBook. You know, you're starting to see all phones now have USB-C connectors instead of uh, micro USB. Or even worse. You know, proprietary. I do kind of wish, you know, I, I, I wish that Apple um, would have moved to the USB-C or Thunderbolt 3 connector instead of Lightning, because Lightning is getting long in the tooth. Maybe we'll see that with the iPhone 8. It would make sense given that it's um, like, I think the 10th year or something, major anniversary of the iPhone. So, um, so I, I would expect that to happen. But the, the, the case is like, here, this is a, an Anchor. I love Anchor. Um, this is a USB-C hub. Now, a, a powered hub. It doesn't do data. So, you know, here's the AC or the power cable. It has USB-C to charge and then four USB-3 charging ports. What, are, what? I mean, it has a headphone jack, so you're not really missing out there. I'm um, going to go back here. 
so what what's the tell me i'm going to jump to the comments i'm really interested to see um let me bring the comments up here what i'm ex so colby i'm excited for the first time i would lose that dongle on the road and have zero way of backing up images lose that dongle on the road and have zero way of backing up the images why i mean you can get USB-C to, to USB cables to micro USB if you want and just connect it to the camera, um, the hard drive. I mean, I, I don't, I don't really, I'm not worried about losing the dongle. Um, and if you, if you are, then that's you. I'm not going to, I've never lost dongles um, or anything like that. Yes, it sucks to have to buy adapters. Totally agree with that. But um, for every, there's only one adapter that I couldn't find that, that on Apple's website that I found on Amazon or Monoprice for much cheaper. And that's the uh, USB-C to Thunderbolt 2. So I use Thunderbolt 2 to power these um, black, the Blackmagic um, little Ultra Studio things to connect here. So I need that. Also, I, I have like five, I have five devices daisy chained, daisy chained on Thunderbolt right now in one, one port. So, um, uh, in order to keep using that with the laptop, I, I need to um, get that adapter, which is like, I think 40 or 50 bucks, which sucks. But all the other adapters I found for like 10, 12 bucks on, on uh, Amazon. So I understand it sucks, but I, I'm of, I look to where the, the puck is going, not where it is. And I would much rather have a laptop that will last me, this 15 inches last me several years. So this new one, when it goes two, three years down the road, um, it, we will have USB-C pretty much everywhere, just the way it is. And then uh, in order, you know, I, I wouldn't get the benefits of the faster bus if I have to use older technologies. So that's that. Let's see what else there is. Oh yeah, okay, so Josh brings up another good thing. I was pissed about the MagSafe. I, MagSafe to me, that's the the, connector that Apple uses, the magnetic connector to snap onto the, um, onto the laptop to charge so that if you, um, which is why I hate wires, which is a nice segue to the Bose wire, the Bluetooth headset unboxing. But um, if you knock it, the older connectors, you're, you would be done. The, the, the cable would fray or you would damage the actual port. So with the, magnet, the MagSafe, it just harmlessly falls off. Griffin makes a USB-C to, uh, it's, no, it's just a USB-C power cable, but there's, it, it, it comes off the laptop a little bit and then um, it connects through magnet and then same benefit, just pops off. So I ordered that, definitely worth it if you're getting this computer. In fact, though, it should work on any computer with USB-C that charges through USB-C, so you can get that benefit. Someone's calling me, that's my mom. I'll call her later, sorry, mom. All right. so. Uh, yep, Eric also linked to that. Eric, thanks for linking to the Griffin um, charger. I, I know we have to buy this extra stuff. I get it. And that's why you don't have to, listen, I pay the Apple tax. I happily pay the Apple tax. It's, um, it's the tax you pay to get latest and greatest right away. I understand that. And that's what it is for me. And I'm very appreciative that I get, that I can afford it. So no one's saying you have to do this now. I mean, there might be more elegant solutions coming in a year from now, two years from now. You know, the, the current MacBook Pro is still totally beefy and you'll probably be able to find either uh, used, really good use prices or Apple might um, put in clearance their existing inventory. Um. <laughs> yeah, Lee, I know. <laughs> I do need to call my mom up. Um, so there was a question here regarding 32 gigabytes. How are other laptop manufacturers able to do it? Okay. Good question, Todd. How are other able, how are the manufacturers able to do 32 gigs in laptops? At, w the ones that I've seen, um, it's simple. If you need, if you put more hardware that generates heat, um, and needs more space and fans to dissipate that heat, you need to make it bigger which makes it heavier. So I've seen Windows laptops, like, um, who is that company? Puget, 
Puget Systems. I know that company because my friend Renee Robin has one, a custom one made um, and it's gigantic, but it has 32. It's a ballsy machine, Windows machine. So yeah, I mean, that's how you do it. As far as I know, well, unless there's a, a laptop that is similar in uh, size to this MacBook Pro that has 32 gigs of RAM, I, I don't know about it. But also I don't really research um, PC components as much, which is a, actually to me another benefit. I remember when I was in college, Josh will remember this, we would have these uh, at Syracuse University, we would have um, at the fairgrounds these like um, computer shows and pe vendors would come in from all over. Josh, you remember that? They would come in um, all over and, uh, and you could buy components and it was just maddening. I used to get the Computer Shopper magazine, that fat stack magazine that has all of the latest computers from like Micron and Dell. Um, I don't have to worry about that anymore. I mean, I, I you know, I have, I have what I need here. Um, uh, la, 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 la. Fried RAM, that's right, Josh, fried RAM. Thoughts on Retina versus high DPI? Um, no, uh, I, I, um, I do wish that I was really disappointed to see that Apple kept 1080p on this display when the Pixel has a higher resolution and pixel count. That was kind of a bummer. Um, but I think they're saving all their their stuff for this next iPhone. I think it's good. that's going to kind of, everyone's going to remember what Apple can do with that. I'm not an Apple fanboy. I talk to Colby all the time about switching to, I actually ordered a Pixel and then canceled it the next day or pre-ordered it because I, I, I have a sickness. Um, Zip drives. Yeah, I remember zip drives, Brian, and jazz drives. So wait, um, Eric, what's saying? Um, okay, so Eric Valmond, who's in, who's a, a good buddy of mine who I saw, well, I saw him on stage at Photokina. Um, he lifted up Renee's laptop. It's a beast, but it also, he says, had three SSDs. So yeah, I mean, more space gives you a lot more opportunity, but you're really teetering on that edge between um, what a laptop is, the benefits of a laptop. Same thing with mirrorless. Like you're getting to that point where lenses are getting, you know, everyone wants faster lenses for their mirrorless, which means they have to get bigger and heavier. You start to wonder, wait, what, what, why did I invest in mirrorless to begin with? You know, a big component was for the svelte form factor and the lightweight uh, design. So, um, touch screen versus stop gap of touch. What's that? What's touch bass? Um, so touch screen, um, I don't use my Cintiq when I'm in desktop mode. I don't, I tried for a couple of days to use touch. Um, but for me, I use touch either with a magic trackpad, which I love, or um, if I'm at work, I use my Intuos Pro touch. And it's actually very, very responsive. Um, but I, uh, so with touch screens, I, I t when I think about that, I think about tablets. I think about um, the iPad, which is uh, an operating system that has, which iOS has an operating system that was optimized for touch. So that's kind of, oh, touch bar. Um, good question. Good question. Um, the touch bar for me is a complete novelty um, until I get to use it. I think, you know, it, it'll boil. I don't use any um, Apple core apps. I use um, Airmail for email. I use uh, Fantastical for calendar. Um, and this is for the most part on, on iOS and Mac OS. I use um, Lightroom, Photoshop, On One. You know, I use all these third party apps. So it for me, the touch bar will come down to how well the devs support it. Um, you know, I don't know about having the little timeline with Final Cut Pro, um, what that's going to do. Um, but you know, the demo that they did with Photoshop looked kind of cool. Um, and for me, the big thing, I use one password by agile bits for my password manager. And I've always wished that, um, the, my laptop would have, um, touch ID so that it can authenticate and laptop has touch ID and agile bits on that day announced that they're built already building support for it to unlock. Now, what I would love to see next and what we, I believe we will see next is magic keyboard with touch bar and touch ID. That is without a doubt the, na the next evolutionary step. I don't know though, it might have to be bigger because I don't know what kind of power consumption um, the touch bar will require. 
So it might be bigger. It might be a, I don't know that Apple would also go back to a wired keyboard. It goes against the grain for them right now. So, um, so yeah, that's that. Uh, yeah, one password's the best, Petra. Petra, good to see you. Um, I believe, yeah, so, so I, I believe Josh Lightroom and On One will, will um, rise to the, to the occasion with Touch Bar. They have to, they, they, they have to, um, because um, when you don't take advantage of those types of things, you start to date yourself as a company. So um, I believe that you have to do that. So let's see. All right, you know what, for now, let's go and, because <laughs> we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, how long have we been going for? 40 minutes. Let's just do a quick unboxing. Uh, and then we can go back and wrap up the show. So let me give you a little bit of context, to, context here. This is my pair of the Bose. Oh yeah. <laughs> dongle, <laughs> iPhone dongle. Um, this is the Bose QC 20 I active noise canceling headphones or earbuds rather earbuds. I bought these because I saw a while ago, maybe like two years ago, David Dushman who's a photographer that I really admire, um, said that these are basically next to Jesus for him. And so you can see what are, these are earbuds um, that fit my ears perfectly. I've, I've flown eight, nine hour flights and I've forgotten that they're in my ears. And then this is the battery and the um, noise canceling computer. And it's connected by wire. You know, you have your, um, your typical volume control and uh, function button in the middle with a microphone. And then this button right here can, uh, it um, dynamically engages and disengages the noise canceling processor. So for me, when I'm on the flight, uh, if I if I start to hear, for instance, um, uh, not here, if I see the display saying that something's paused because there's an announcement, I press the button and it, um, it turns off so I can hear through the audio. Um, now, I hate wires. Uh, you know, Colby travels, I cannot stand wires. Colby, I don't know if you have this issue. When I get up, I always try to sit on the window seat um, because I feel I have all that extra space. When I get up, it is a, a comedy of errors. Um, again, that's where MagSafe is brilliant because I don't know how many times I've kicked my power cable out. Um, but same thing with the, the, the headphones. Sometimes I forget that they're connected to the computer, you know, and I just get up instinctively and, you know, get jerked back. I hate wires, but I love this set of earbuds. So we now have these. This, um, this uh, earbud was announced at the same time as Bose QC35 QC um, wireless. So these are old, I think QC15s, these earbuds, wired earbuds. That's what I use here. Same noise canceling. Um, they announced these. 35s in August, I think, or even, yeah, August maybe. Um, and they released those right away and I got a pair of those which are fantastic. Um, noise canceling is phenomenal, but it compared to two devices over Bluetooth. So I have it at work paired to my, uh, my MacBook Pro and my iPhone. So if I'm listening to something on my laptop, I can also, uh, if a call comes in, I can just switch over without any issue. So. This was what, I, when I saw this, I could not wait because again, like I said, I hate wires. Um, and I feel that Bluetooth technology has come along so far with Bluetooth LE and Bluetooth, I think four is the major version now. Um, so when they announced this, uh, the wireless version of this with active noise canceling, I was like, I couldn't wait. It was supposed to come out in September and they pushed it to October. And as soon as they came out in mid October, I ordered it. So let's go ahead here, um, get that going, and let's open it up. Whoops, and I already cut the box a little bit. So I always keep my boxes, I do always for everything. I'm about to list uh, iPhone 6S Plus because I have my iPhone 7 Plus. I always keep that stuff because for me it's uh, resale value. And someone brought, okay, going back to Going back to Android and iOS, there was a, on The Verge or something, they were talking about the, one of the other things to consider, forget about operating system and all that stuff and, you know, third party app support, resale value. And they were saying that the iPhone holds its value way better than any Android phone. 
And I agree with that because there's like one iPhone or two iPhones and then there are 50 Android devices. So I'm gonna be very interested to see if that changes now that Google is kind of owning um, the Pixel phone. All right, so take this off. Okay, let's probably close this. All right, so yeah, yeah, I sliced the box right there. Focus, you stupid camera. Okay, whatever. Now let's open it up. Oh, nice kind of little book kind of experience. I, I, uh, I'm becoming more and more impressed with people's uh, unboxing. Okay, and then, okay, it just opens up like that. All right, so here it is. Um, so one of the things about the, these earbuds is that they needed to, in order to make it wireless, Bose needed to take this thing and put it somewhere um, that it could uh, power the unit and also power the um, noise canceling. So it's this kind of brace, this neck necklace thing. And so you basically, it, it, um, it's very flexible. So it should, you know, even for the thickest of necks, it should fit fine. And then you have your earbuds here. And I think I'm putting them on backwards. Wait, like this? Yeah, this way. All right. So right and left. Fits perfectly. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to pair right now, um, but I can report back online if you have questions. But the earbuds seem to be the exact same, uh, or yeah, as these. I like that they're darker, um, kind of look kind of cool. This is, so I'm just wearing it now and couldn't even tell that it's on me right now. I don't know how, I wanna try it when I wear a collared shirt, um, probably will sit inside the collar, but it's not heavy at all right now. I don't really feel it. Um, actually, I feel a little bit of the rubber just because it's cold, but for the most part, um, it's fine. Then let's see what else there is. Micro USB cable for charging. This is the only thing that I'm kind of bummed about. Um, so this is the case for the QC20Is. Small, you can throw it in your pocket. One of the reasons also why I switched to the 20Is from the, ear, the, the cans is because the the QC35 case is, is huge. It's like this, just fatter. So, you know, it's one of the kind of uh, um, compromises that I'm gonna have to make. But for me, it's totally worth it to have a wireless headset that I never have to worry about when I get up from, uh, if I'm on an airplane or something. To me, that's just worth everything. Because um, I, I, I hate wires. Audio and wires are the worst. Oh, here's my thing. All right, let's go back to this and we'll wrap things up. I'm gonna look at comments. All right, let's see what we have here. Oh, Mickey, so you have these? You, you have these too? If you do, um, comment in there and tell me what you think, like what's the audio like? What's the Bluetooth connectivity like? That's also important for me. Um, you have to take them off if you go through airport security. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, so I don't ever really, um, I'm not, I never, when I'm going through security, I have nothing on me. Like my headphones are not on, I'm not talking to anyone. I just want to get through that miserable process as quickly as possible. So it's not, a, not an issue. Um, what's the battery life on those? Um, I don't know. Um, I think 10 or so hours. Um, I listen to um, with my 35s, which I think would have a larger battery, but, oh, and also it, they come with uh, larger and smaller uh, little inserts. But uh, I don't know, I can't remember what they quoted as battery life. Um, up, to, uh, up to 10 hours per charge. So, um, that should be okay. Well, the other thing I need to figure out is, okay, up to 10 hours per charge. If I'm flying to Sealy in Australia, that's like, what, a 17, 18 hour flight. 
So what I w I'm interested in is whether I can continue using it if I tether using uh, longer micro USB to USB. Um, Josh, I hear no Bluetooth compression. Yeah, so uh, Josh is saying that he's got, um, I don't know what the RBH, RBH what's RBH? Um, but the Sony's like, same thing with the Bose, I hear no compression whatsoever. Um, and uh, the noise cancellation is, is like voodoo magic. It's just amazing. Uh, eight to nine hour flight, that's just a hop. Exactly, Lee, right. <laughs> Um, okay, so Todd's got the same ones. He's saying that's good. All right, so let me see. 55 million hours. Yeah, Lee. <laughs> Lee, I, you must be happy with the new Final Cut Pro. I'm excited to see what you do with that, what your thoughts are there. Um, all right. Listen, 51 minutes, not bad, right? Um, so with that... I, I, I want to thank all of you for hanging out. Uh, it's always good to see familiar faces and new faces. Um, uh, like I said, I don't really have a set schedule for this. This week was, it, it would have been criminal not to do a show because of all the cool announcements. I hope you enjoyed the kind of content that was uh, shared here. Uh, keep the conversation going. We can use it in the comments section. Uh, and uh, you can just follow me here and on my website, which is matias.com. So with that, I want to thank you guys. I hope you have a fun and safe and exciting Halloween tomorrow. And uh, we'll see you for, what is it, episode 17 the next time. All right, everyone. Later.